My name is David Shavron, President and CEO of the Consumer Brands Association. We're really excited to have you join us today for our CPG Speaks uh, series. This series allows us to uh, come together in the industry to learn important lessons from company leaders, and they really help you think differently about the business and the industry and ongoing trends in consumer products. I am super excited today to be joined by Kathy Widmer, Group President, North America and Latin America for Kenview, and a member of the Consumer Brands Association Board of the Directors. Kathy has more than 30 years of experience in leading businesses. Prior to joining the private sector, Kathy served as a captain and field artillery battery commander in the U.S. Army. In addition to her role at Kenview, Kathy also serves on the board of directors for Texas Roadhouse and is the chair of the board of directors of the Wounded Warrior Project. We're going to dive into the state of the industry, including trends and in personal care, uh, Kenview's approach to DEI, Kathy's personal history, leadership style, and really how she sees Kenview uh, moving forward into the future. So, Kathy, we're thrilled to have you join us today. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, David. It's a great, it's great to be here. I'm joining you from uh, beautiful Skillman, New Jersey. Here, that's that's in the that's in the backdrop here. I'm rocking the Kenview green here. Um, Excellent. That's good. It's making New Jersey look good. So that's great. Uh, excellent. Let's let's start with some background on Kenview. Uh, that you know that name may be new to some folks, although the products certainly wouldn't be new. So just give us a little history about the company and uh, and about the the your products and the sectors you cover. Yep. Yep. So so I'll I'll start by telling you that. If you didn't take Latin, you might not know what Kenview means. It's it's two Latin roots, and it it essentially stands for knowledge lights the way. Uh, so wow. it's a it's a unique it's a unique company name. We're all really thrilled with it, um, and we like to say that we were probably with you in your bathroom this morning when you were getting ready to start your day. When you consider the products that we have in wow. our portfolio, they're on the OTC side. They're brands like Tylenol, Motrin, Zyrtec, Benadryl, Zarbi's supplements, and, and others. And then on the essential health and skin health side of the business, uh, we have Neutrogena, Aveeno, Luberderm, uh, Band-Aid, Listerine, Johnson's Baby, Aveeno Baby, and others on, on that side as well. So chances are uh, we were with you in your bathroom this morning, and, and that's all about um, the rituals that get you ready for your day. And we see that as incredibly important. Uh, our purpose, actually, the, the statement of our purpose is realize the power, uh, the extraordinary power of everyday care. And so right. we, we see those rituals as being, you know, super important in setting people and their families up um, for a great experience and a, and a great day. And, um, you know, as, as, you, as you know, we are the, the spun off uh, consumer group from Johnson & Johnson, now forming our own company as Kenview. We had listing day on the New York Stock Exchange uh, about a month ago, which right. was amazingly awesome. I, you know, Congratulations I, on that, by the way. I mean, we just, uh, you know, you just think of uh, in, in a career, a couple of bucket list items. I never even imagined that that's something that, that I would get to do. It yeah. was super fun. Um, and, and honestly, the, I think the most exciting part of it is you're just looking down from the balcony on the stock exchange and seeing a couple hundred of our colleagues on the floor, super excited to, to launch this business and give it a successful start. So, um, so we're, we're real excited. We're a month in and, um, and building for the success of the future. That's, that's great. What, I mean, what a story, what incredible brands. And again, attached to everybody's daily experience uh, in a really integrated way. Um, so thank you for that. Let, let's dive in and talk a little bit about the market you're in and consumers and consumer behavior uh, and how you see consumers, you know, where are they in this uh, in this journey in terms of uh, the economy and post-COVID and the rest, and how do you see them changing? So, you know, what would your, let's start pretty broad. Generally, what are your thoughts on the current business environment and sort of what trends are you seeing with the consumer? Yeah, so so I'll, I'll start with the consumer. I think there's a couple of other things on the business environment that are interesting, but, yeah. you know, if you reflect back three years ago, like three years ago, exactly, you know, June of 2020, what we were all doing, you know, yeah. we were baking bread, we were ordering everything through e -com, we were streaming a heck of a lot of TV, yeah. renovating our homes, uh, washing our hands a lot, uh, and 
you know, there were a whole lot of uh, behavior shifts and accelerations in certain segments and categories. And, you know, fast forward three years later to where we are now. And, you know, a lot of those sub segments um, have moderated a bit, you know, the, the, you know, sense of urgency around a lot of those, you know, has, has waned a little bit, but many of them and many of them in our business have leveled out at a, at a new level, a new higher oh, level. Interesting. So, and, and, you know, the, the piece that, that we love is um, what has not, what has only accelerated has been, you know, consumer focus on health and wellness as yeah. pivotal um, to their lives. And they're probably, you know, there really is no higher currency than the, you know, your health and wellness or those of, you know, people you love. Uh, yeah. And so there really isn't anything more important you know, we, we are, we're very privileged to, to work in those categories where, where, you know, that, that interest remains. Um, but certainly expectations of, um, you know, companies to, to deliver innovative products, to be incredibly convenient, to meet consumers exactly where they want to be met, how they want to be met, uh, um, are, are very high. And, you know, I've, I've spent 30 years in a career always talking about change and always talking about yeah. acceleration of trends, but certainly the last three years are, are you know, are just at a very, very different level in, in terms of pace. Um, in the, in the business environment, you know, obviously there's a, there's a lot happening, but the, I think we all got a bit of a supply chain wake up call in, yeah. uh, in the last few years. And there's still some ripple effects of that sort of floating through the system. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of industry f- spent decades focusing on the efficiency of their supply chain and, and getting cost as low as possible, which is always important. But I think we all got a little bit of a wake up call in terms of the importance of, uh, of the effectiveness of, of a supply chain and the robustness. So everything from now procurement to manufacturing networks to transportation, and then all the way to getting the product to the store shelf, you know, yeah. where we have we have retail customers who um, have challenges with store labor and and lots of other of other issues that that demand you know real attention to detail and making sure that consumers when when they want products whether those are online or offline um, that they're presented to them and they're available. Um, that's a you know that's been a huge wake up call, and you know I think what what I see emerging in the last in the last year or so is after several years of focusing on execution, you know, you could argue all through COVID, there was, it was basically get to the fundamentals of getting product out, getting in yeah. front of consumers where and when they need it. And now this resurgence of innovation and an expectation that we continue to bring great products forward and great experiences to consumers is, is a, is a, I don't know if you call it a trend because innovation is always, um, you know, high on our list in CPG, but I think the last the last couple of years have been us all kind of fu- focused on fundamentals and and right. a little less on on newness and now it's all back. That's interesting, and you're you're definitely seeing it, it, you know there's I, I take from that that you do see some enduring changes in consumer behavior post COVID, uh, which you know we're always trying to anticipate. But then part of what's going back to is their desire for new product, right? It just desire for innovation, desire for, for new solutions for their lives. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I, I think that the, the bar for innovation grows um, tremendously, especially in a, in a digital environment. And um, I have a little gizmo here. I want to share with you because I think it's, you know, it's super cool. This is my phone. And on the end of my phone, this is an otoscope. And so if, if I had this when my kids were young, I would have been thrilled because essentially this allows you to diagnose an ear infection in a child at 2 a.m. and then God. immediately go to telemed to have that to have that medication delivered to you. So taking the anxiety and the you know very unhappy baby in the middle of the night and and being able to because I think at least my experience back when, when my kids were that young was I was pretty sure it was an ear infection. And so you're going to go through the whole hassle of taking a very unhappy child, you know, to the emergency room to get treatment and then follow that on to find your way to get, to get a prescription is uh, it's no fun. And, um, but innovations like this, you know, which um, help to, um, 
improve the experience dramatically on basic issues that consumers that consumers have. There's still there's still a world of opportunity out there. That's incredible. I have to tell you, that is <laughs> truly incredible. As somebody, right. yeah, um, rest. Check. We just we just launched this about a about a year ago, and we're we have it in a pilot test. Um, primarily through uh, e-commerce as we kind of perfect the pieces of that chain. But um, we're, we're super excited about it because it absolutely meets a need. Uh, the uh, And I, you could totally see the tie-ins, by the way. There's no more telemedicine now, so you can diagnose and also figure out solutions with your healthcare provider that much more seamlessly. It's that... That really is innovation, right? That changes how somebody uh, how somebody lives their life. Um, can we, let's dive into the digital engagement with the consumer, if if we if we can, just for a moment. Um, you know, obviously in the consumer product space, it's still a lot of uh, you know working through retailers and working through good retail partnerships where, where folks. Um, uh, have been recipients of the marketing or recipients of the message and go in that retailer to get that product and all the supply chains that are designed related to that. But obviously in digital space now, consumers have other expectations. Maybe they uh, want to get it through uh, through other means, digital means. Maybe they want to communicate with you more directly. What kind of trends are you seeing in terms of a digital engagement with the consumers? What do they want? What do they expect? And and how are you kind of adapting the business to that? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it, it definitely starts with what consumers expect and what they very quickly adapt to themselves. And you you need to be there. I mean, I remember just a couple of years ago where we were all we're all asking what what, what was TikTok, and 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 now mm. it is a very very legitimate, it's probably single biggest social platform um, for communicating with with consumers. The importance of influencers who you know, versus traditional um, brand spokespeople, um, yeah. the world completely changed in the, you know, in that direction. And then leveraging that platform for direct commerce is, is really interesting. Um, and then there are still, you know, a, a good strong percentage of, of consumers who like to touch and feel products and see them at retail and have that full experience of exploring uh, a retail store and then everything in between, you know, I know what I want. I want it from my from my local Walmart or, or you know, my my local Kroger, but I'm going to do curbside delivery because it's more convenient for me. And all of those choices put, you know, the consumer um, in the driver's seat. And, you know, one of the, you know, in the last, I guess it's probably been four or five years, the emergence of our retail partners as, as real media experts, yeah. um, especially Walmart, Target, um, and Amazon, uh, who I think in the retail space probably have captured about 80 80 percent or so of of um, of media. It's very sophisticated in terms of our our ability now to um, speak to a consumer when she's interested in a product. And when you consider investments that I you know I remember making 20 years ago in in retail, you kind of hope that they work. You kind of hope that they, you know, reached her, you know, at the right time in the right place. And, and honestly, there's a lot of waste in that system. And, and now there's a, a good deal of precision. The data we share back and forth helps us make sure that we're the, the return on investment for both sides, for the, for the retail partner and for the manufacturer are awesome. And, and it's great for the consumer because she's, she's getting tailored to her what she needs to hear and not a whole lot of noise outside of that. Um, so, you know, it is, it obviously it has, it has changed everything, but it also opens all kinds of innovative spaces for us. So, you know, it's just, there's just a world of opportunity in digital that's still to be explored. That's so interesting. You know, I have, I have some background in the media space less last few years of my life um you know there's the old john wanamaker quote about you know newspaper advertising which is you know uh I, you know half my advertising spends being wasted i just don't know which half and and there was a early on in digital advertising there was this view that oh that you know the digital advertising is going to fix that well really the dirty little secret for a lot of components that didn't really, really fix that but now you're seeing with retail media networks and the intense first party data at point of purchase that you were really you're getting real time uh data uh about uh, consumer behavior consumer intent and and that, those partnerships are going to be critical moving forward 
I, I, I so take it you'd agree, right? And I just, you know, you, it, 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 they will create little mini industries, you know, will, will come out of that and, and will surface in terms of, you think of media optimization that happened in the legacy way, and now you have a whole different uh, platform of media that will spin off um, yeah. all, kinds of, all kinds of industry in and of itself. Um, but it's pretty great that the, you know, you truly the waste is coming out. I, I don't know if waste is the right word, but, but that like, which half, which half doesn't work, you know, yeah. it's not half anymore. Right. So that the right. margin of error there gets, gets smaller and smaller. And to the degree that we perfect the return on investment in that space, I feel great about it because I, it, it feels like it's within our um, capability to, to get better and better at, at the return on those dollars. And there really is a lot of alignment with the retailers. You know, you could quickly get into sort of a competitive uh, uh, perspective, but for the most part, what I'm what I'm seeing anyway is people feeling like the interests are aligned in terms of you trying to connect with the consumer and sell your product, and the retailers wanting you to do that in the best way yeah, possible. I think that's what we all want, right? We want we want we want him or her to be happy. We want them to find what they what what they need or they want, and and when we do that, it's a win win on both sides. So sharing the, sharing the information, um, kind of opening the toga a little bit uh, mutually uh, helps us serve serve her better, and then we and then we both win in the process. And I think everybody's kind of coming around to that. Great. So you know, classic question, crystal ball, uh, which really fun. Uh, you know, where do you see the consumer headed in two to four years from now? Obviously, big time of tumult post-COVID. People are like pausing, but the consumers never pause, right? There's going to be uh, trends and, and changes going forward. What are you really seeing as, as, as trends propelling in the, say, two to four year time frame? Well, I, I mean, I think the, the, the one that, that we watch closely is, you know, in the health and, in the health and wellness space, is what can I do preventatively um, to preserve and protect my wellness and that of and that of people who I care about and, and my family members. And so that that move a bit from reactionary and acute treatment to what might I do to prevent and and to give myself the best chance to stay healthy for a longer and viable um, is you know, I don't know, that's a two to four year trend, but that's a in perpetuity after, especially after the experience we've had in the last few years, that's, that's, that has elevated. And, you know, and I think this, this expectation that I'm going to, I'm going to be able to access what I want, when I want, however I want, I want to pay for it, how I want is it's, it will only get dialed up and the convenience of, you know, one button, purchase power and and the ability to get something to your home within 24 hours is it built a very high expectation yeah. among consumers and I remember being at a uh, at a meeting uh, at, at Walmart where Doug McMillan was sharing that they were experimenting um, with drones with drone delivery and they delivered I think they delivered a, a pediatric medicine product to I'm sure it was, I'm sure it was pediatric Tylenol, by the way, right. but anyway, it was a pediatric medicine to the front lawn of a woman who had ordered it and they got it to her house in 22 minutes. And she ordered something else a, a week later and it took 24 minutes and she complained about how long it took. And she Amazing. sent it back, back to the company. And then you realize that you said, you know, yeah. once you set a bar, that's the bar. And, uh, and so that's a, that's something for all of us to keep an eye on. It's the reliability of being able to deliver on promises to consumers, you know, that's, that's where supply chain and networks and, and the back end of things become really important. Yeah. I, I have a working theory. I haven't seen any studies about this, about how people's experience in digital spaces have creeped out into other places. So like, you know, Google search or something, you can figure out who was in the cast of Gilligan's Island immediately, right? You can, there's so much there immediate, right? And that then there's sort of this expectation built up that I want everything else a bit why is it not here now why you know and this uh, immediacy and then of course uh, if you're dealing in any kind of physical good but particularly physical goods like you create that people use on a daily basis just building the systems to try to meet that expectation is just incredible uh both a challenge and opportunity um well good I see this little this what i think is is super interesting is because of how much we're all plugged in and 
and have these, you know, you know, this immediacy um, kind of requirements that what do you do when you check out, you know, that, yeah. that and that that's kind of an emerging space too, is what does checking out look like? What is relaxing? look like now and how do you, you know how do you recharge and and sort of rebuild your energy in a in a in a, in a little bit of a a, a non-digital ecosystem how you know how do you do that and i think that's going to be an emerging you know an interesting trend too that's fantastic god from your lips to god's ears i certainly hope um let, let's change uh topics a little bit um uh, let's talk about uh uh, workforce and D, E, and I in particular, because I know that's a big uh, area of focus for you and for Kenview generally. Can you tell us about how Kenview is thinking about, uh, let's, let's dive into D, E, and I in particular. Um, it, you know, it can, it's important to companies in a labor force perspective, but it's also important personally. Uh, tell us about D, E, and I initiatives at Kenview, both your perspectives on it and then what you're trying to achieve at the company. Yeah. So, I mean, I certainly, I, I have a personal passion for it and I know, you know, my, my colleagues at Kenview do as well. I think m mine comes from a lot of experiences of being among the first somewhere, you know, you, yeah. first women, one of the first women at West Point, one of the first women in the artillery, you know, first women in to work in a, you know, I came to this company working in supply chain in a factory. And, um, and so I, you know, I think that helped build a, a personal affinity um, for, for, um, for diversity and, and equity and inclusion. And that's very consistent with the values, uh, at Kenview where, where, where we are, and we have been for many years focused on ensuring that, um, we, we represent internally, um, the communities that we serve, um, with our, with our products and services. And it's, mm -hmm. it's very important for us to do that both because it's good business, but because, but also that we, we see the value, um, you know, very significantly in the in the in the quality of the decisions we make, in the outcomes that we drive um, th through DEI. But all of that requires in uh, inclusion, um, which is, you know, I think the, is the cornerstone of DEI. Is that um, you know diversity is can can often be about the numbers and representation, but inclusion is a choice, and it can be. We've We've um, we're all in for that choice, and we have a couple of key partnerships that we've leveraged uh, over the years um, to really bring this to life out in the world. Uh, one that I'm involved in, I co-sponsor uh, in a partnership with with Walmart, a um, a focus on Black maternal health, and mm -hmm. so our two companies in in cooperation with a uh, CareSource, which is a, a, a healthcare provider, an insurance provider in the state of Georgia. Are are taking on this issue um, in in live and in real time. So if you're if you're a black mom in the state of Georgia, yeah. you are three times more likely to to um, experience serious complications or die during pregnancy, childbirth, or postpartum. And so, breaking that issue down and all of its complexities and focusing on it through we have a we have a program and in three parts has been extremely rewarding for all of us. It's very hands on. Uh, and we have providers down in that market and are, and are living into that as we speak. And then we also have, you know, as, as this is Pride Month, we are um, we have a 12 year partnership with Care with Pride that is focused on um, fairness and equity among families. And um, and, we, and we're long invested in that. So it's part of business uh, for us, but it's also a part of how we um, uh, work and, and, um, and sort of live side by side with each other as colleagues here, here at Kenview. And it's a, it's a big, big in our belief system and values. That's, um, that, that's great. I mean, and, you know, both those initiatives you described critically, uh, important, uh, but I, you know, going back to what we talked about in terms of your personal com commitment as, as well, the, you know, I remember I wrote an article a few years ago about, uh, uh, I think that one was particularly about women in tech and the companies that tended to do better at having a more diverse workforce in that context. And one of the key drivers of companies that were more inclusive was really the personal passion of the CEO, right? Because people can kind of uh, fall into old patterns and you need somebody to say, no, we're going to be different and we're going to hold people accountable to be different and really drive leadership. So, you know, that's, you know, you're kind of, the story you told, I think, is is 
is a critical component of uh, being a better uh, company that is actually delivers on uh, DE and I, uh, inclusion being a key part of it that often doesn't get talked about enough. So that, that's uh, um, that's really important and certainly certainly important for the workforce of today, but also the future. Um, you know, if we could dig into that just a little bit in terms of how you view your story and your role as a leader, you know, what what role should the leader play in terms of driving uh, an organization forward, in particular on uh, on workforce issues like DE and I or taking care of your employees? You know, what is the what is the role of leadership in terms of delivering? Well, I always tend to think that we're we're all in the people business. Um, yeah. At Kenview here, we're in the people business, and we just happen to be in the in the in the world of your daily rituals and and your your self care. But we're in the people business, and nothing happens here without um, without our colleagues and you know bringing their you know you know essentially the role of leaders to help help an organization live to its potential. And um, you know personally, I think that starts with it, it, when I think of what the leader's responsibility is. It's first, it's great to be a good storyteller as a leader because yeah. you need to establish the vision, the compelling vision that an organization an organization needs to believe in. And that requires a bit of a bit of good storytelling. Anyone can learn it, but but it's I think a cornerstone of a, of a strong leader. And I also believe that needs to be combined with empathy. And when I and when I say that, I I, I it's because I believe if you if you want people to go from here to there, you have to acknowledge where here is. Like I need yeah. to acknowledge the start point. If, if I have an exhausted workforce and we have an urgent issue that we need to resolve, then, then you want to start with an acknowledgement of where they are today and, and then the compelling vision for, for where we need to go. So I think empathy plays actually a very significant um, leadership role. And then it's great to catch people doing the right thing after that, you know, S yeah. small, large, you know, recognition for being on the path to success goes a, goes a long way and rewarding people for what, what you want to see versus, you know, the reverse approach, I think is, you know, it's not, not that different than, than parenting, you know, you usually get a much better, a much better outcome. Um, and I think that that's, you know, that's a lot about, you know, DE&I falls into that category too. It's about like, let's tell the story of what we believe in and what we want to, um, what we want to make sure our consumers see from our brands and our colleagues see from the way we work as a, as an organization and that we reward those behaviors. That's excellent. Um, I want to dig into a little bit more about your personal story and your leadership style, but before we transition further into that topic, I do want to remind the audience that, you know, we've saved time at the end of the session today for questions. So please submit those using the Q and a panel at the bottom of the screen. Uh, we want and welcome questions. So, Kathy, let's dig into. I mean, you you do have something of a unique uh, story in terms of your career in the military, leading up to the career at Kenview. Um, but let's let, let's start with the personal journey. Tell us a little bit about uh, your your story, where you're from, your personal journey, and then how that has all brought you here and molded your approach to leadership. You know, there's no, first of all, there's absolutely no way I would have put, predicted where I would be right now. I grew up in a third generation military family, um, went to West Point as the fourth class that had women. Uh, wow. And and I'll tell you a little, a little bit about that is mostly I wanted to see if I could get in. And then, and then you find yourself there and then you say, well, let me see if I can graduate and before, <laughs> you know, an officer in the army. And, um, and I joined the artillery because um, back then, it was you know it was one of the very few combat arms assignments that were open to women at the time, and so and okay. the combat arms are sort of the prestige of of the military. So I, I wanted that challenge and and um, and chase that down and um, and but this was all pre Afghanistan, pre uh, pre Gulf, and so my husband is my West Point classmate. We were in the artillery together, and we were when we were having that debate about do we stay or go. Uh, or leave the military. Um, you know, the, honestly, the reason we left is back in those days, it was very hard to keep a family together in any way. We had, a, we, had we had our oldest daughter by then. And so Jay and Jay hired both of us. Um, oh, wow. and, and, and so we moved to Jay and Jay, but my first, my first job at Jay and Jay 
literally, was managing um, uh, about 40 men who worked on the night shift making stay free maxi pads. So it's been a <laughs> long, great. Been a long journey since then. Yeah. And a lot of little, you know, I'm not going to take you through all of it, but just to say that there were a lot of, there were a lot of start overs. Um, yeah. you know, I started over out of the military. I started over after eight years in supply chain in order to become a commercial leader, started over at the bottom um, and, and have looped back a couple of times in my career um, to get some experiences that I thought were pivotal and, and, and have a shot at a couple of roles that I, I really, um, from the time I came to j and I always wanted to run the Tylenol business. And I did a lot of, you know, loops around and sideways positions in order to cue myself up to be under consideration for that. Um, and, and that's really what got me to here. It was, it was more a little bit of the patience to, um, to, to do what it took to get the right experiences to, to be in a position to be able to do, you know, the role I'm in now. And I'm incredibly grateful. I also left J and J for five years, um, and went to, to work in prestige beauty in, in New York. And, oh was grateful for the opportunity to come back, you know? So they call me a boomerang here, and which I, I say proudly, um, uh -huh. really, really happy to be back. And, uh, and it's just a, that's a, that comes from just having shared values and, and feeling like this is a right fit. By the way, I love companies that welcome people back. I, I think some of the highest performing companies I've ever engaged with uh, understand that people have personal journeys and and you know welcome you back. If I could dig into it a little bit on uh, particularly starting out on the supply chain side, I guess it's I guess my understanding that that's not an uncommon place for former military folks to get entry uh, into various parts of the industry, particularly on the CPG side. What what has that taught you that's been enduring? I assume a lot, but in terms of, you know, understanding sort of the basic plumbing of supply chain has to inform what you're doing on a, on a daily basis. But talk a little bit about that. Especially the last couple of years where yeah. having having had first day, firsthand supply chain experience during the most difficult years for any supply chain um, has been helpful to me as a, as a general manager. Um, but there, there, there. You know, so there's the functional benefit of just understanding how supply chain works, and but, but, a lot of it to me is honestly is you know I come back to empathy a bit. You know, supply chain is at the execution arm of of an organization, and they either they execute either great plans or not so great plans, and so understanding that that doing a good job upstream and planning for supply chain to be at their very best a lot of the a lot of that those that decision making happens outside of supply chain and and having had that end to end experience and knowing what it's like to catch plans that weren't that great um yeah. makes you super sensitive to it and and also to just you know the simple notion of remembering the people who come in and work shifts, who work shift or shifts around the clock during COVID, um, and were you know on the spot when people needed them most, especially you know our our, our colleagues who are working in our Tylenol and Listerine plants during COVID, you know having had the experience of being in a plant, and sometimes it's you know it's lonely when it's two a.m. and you're making oh, yeah. you know, Tylenol in the middle of the night, you know it's 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 great to be appreciated, and those things follow you around after you've had an experience working in supply chain. Yeah, one of the things I want to do at Consumer Brands is talk more about the miracle of essentially the systems behind what what everybody does to deliver every day. I mean, to to have a whatever the product is, to have it be available within a hundred yards of just about everybody in the United States, and and to have it be sold and rotated and delivered there every day in a sustained basis is there's something miraculous that really other industries there aren't many industries that have to do that, right? You don't buy cars every day. You don't, there's a, you certainly don't buy software every day. There's something kind of miraculous about the systems we have to have in place to do that. And, and, and I think people think of that in a corporate sense that they think of big organizations like Kenview or Johnson and Johnson or, or big CPG, you know, companies that, you know, that are, that are in the, that are in CBA as well. And think of it as, 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 as though they're not a human that, you know, that they're not full of humans. I mean, these, these yeah. companies are, and, and our company are full of families and they're, 
and our, you know, people who work in our factories, people who touch these products as they go through their evolution to get into the hands of a consumer are supporting their families and they have their, and they have lives too. And it's, you know, so these corporations are nothing but a huge group of families, um, you know, working toward, you know, delivering for consumers every day. And sometimes I feel like, you know, it's, that's a little forgotten when we talk big corporations, because, you know, that kind of comes in and out of favor, but it really is, you know, a large group of, uh, of families. Great. Uh, you be okay diving into some questions. Sure. Excellent. Um, let's see. Um, let's start with, well, uh, the, one of these questions ties into another question I was going to ask you, but so it all fits together. Uh, what is the hardest lesson you've learned in your career? I was also going to ask if you have a piece of advice for folks, but what's a what's a hard lesson that you've learned? I, I'm going to say that about midway through my career, uh, I was I was not so gently told by a manager that I work for that what got me to that point wasn't going to get me the rest of the way. And and that was because you know, I always wanted to be the person with the answer. I was always, you know, I was the one in the room who probably wasn't listening as well as I needed to listen and talking more than, and talking over other people and, um, and had been rewarded early in career for behaviors that were, you know, super assertive, lean forward, alpha type uh, mm -hmm. approaches to, to business. And, and, you know, what I firmly believe is true is, is that in, you know, large organizational leadership roles, you have to be a great listener. You end up becoming, a, basically you're a vessel for other people. You're a, yeah. you're, a, um, you're a platform for your team to perform at their best potential. And that puts leaders in, you know, depending on the situation in different roles. Every once in a while I'm out front. Um, every once in a while I'm at the very back of the organization, but mostly you're kind of shepherding them from the side. And, um, and just, I was, I'm grateful and I'm still very close to this, this uh, J and J leader who gave me that advice. But what she used to do is if she, if I was sitting in a meeting with her and she, and she saw me leaning into these, uh, you know, behaviors that weren't going to get me where I needed to go, she would put a hand on me. And I do that today. I do that with other, other people. What a gift. That's a real gift. It is. It was, uh, it, you, you talk about like a little bit of a wake up call because it's a way of signaling you're doing it right now. You're doing what I'm yeah. trying to convince you to do. Otherwise you're doing it right now. And it's like a little bit treatment. <laughs> and so it was extremely effective. That's great. What a great, uh, what a great help and, men and mentor. Um, uh, so uh, we're going to, we'll change directions a little bit you know with with the apple uh uh, uh vr announcement this week uh, and obviously we there's technological announcements we could make every week um and, you know particularly on the ai front these days the uh, question is how does kenview see new technologies impacting their relationship with the consumer whether it's ar ai ar vr uh, just all the new ways that uh, are emerging, and frankly, you mentioned one of them, which was TikTok, which is you know, in vertical video. You know, how do you, I guess you start by, how do you think about new technologies and evaluating them as opportunities for Kenview? Yeah, so I think, you know, it all starts with our strategy and our values and ensuring that, you know, what we're, what we might be considering are consistent, are consistent with those, but we see all those possibilities, and we mm -hmm. understand that that's, um, that that's, has all the potential of delivering a more precise um, and enjoyable consumer experience. So, so we're invested, but I think, you know, we, we're all kind of watching what's happening with, especially AI at the moment and making sure we understand where, where are, you know, I don't know if comfort zone is the right, are the right words, but where's the, where's the arena of possibility for us and the applications that make sense and what do we feel like we want to see develop a little more out in the marketplace before that's something that we think is appropriate for our business? Those are those are decisions that you know that we're making pretty quickly because of the pace of that uh, of innovation in that space. Yeah. But it certainly you you can tell that there's tremendous potential uh, for businesses who can figure out how to harness that. Um, it's not just for speed; it's for the precision of and the efficacy of what you're trying to get done. Oh yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's 
Uh, and it's also one of those areas that anybody who tells you they know exactly what's going on is lying to you. <laughs> you know, it's the, we're kind of all figuring it out oh, at well, once. Well, yeah, we, everybody, I, I, there isn't, there, there aren't three days that go by where you're not getting some new leveled up explanation of, of what's happening around you. And I think we're all perpetually students in, in that area. I got a, I got a, on my, on my phone, I think it was in my Instagram feed the other day, it was um, resumes with, through chat GPT. And it was, it was something else. I mean, it really was <laughs> unbelievable what the capability is now. And, you know, some of it has you scratching your head and some of it's just amazing. Yeah, it's incredible. I don't know if you saw that the other day, a lawyer submitted a brief through chat GPT and it cited all these cases and the cases were all false, <laughs> by the way. So it just, okay. it just made up a bunch of cases. Um, so it's, it's like tremendous and tremendously kind of crazy at the same time. Um, well, let's, uh, two more. Um, it's a pretty macro question, but I think it does get at, at what people are wrestling with. In terms of what do you feel are the biggest challenges facing CPG companies today? Is it the state of the economy? Is it consumer uncertainty? Is it retailer expectations? Sort of what is the big things that are keeping you up at night at a kind of macro level? I, I mean, I think that it's it's the how adaptable an organization can be in in an uncertain environment is. Right is I, I think what we, we, everyone's trying to figure out, you know, what do you respond to and create a strategy around as an organization? And what do you wait to run its course? Um, you know, in, in figuring those things out is, is a little bit of the special sauce, honestly, and, and, and what we're going to, you know, what we're going to respond to. But I think as a, as an organization, that adaptability, that, you know, having eyes and ears out all the time, having people, um, with a great focus on the external and not getting too wrapped up in the internal is is going to be super helpful in in regard to that. But um, you know, I think we're we're interested in making sure that we and it, it can be especially that we leverage the possibilities that are out there. It's just you have to pick and choose because there's there's more available to uh, to point your your yourself at than than you can really execute. Great. What, one last question. And that was a macro question. I probably should have ended with that one. But then this other kind of more narrow question came in, which is really interesting, I think. Um, with the innovation of the Otoscope, your company is, uh, is that you showed early, which is amazing, by the way. Uh, do you believe that the divide between healthcare monitoring and healthcare treatment is becoming more narrow? And is that really the goal? Because obviously, you have a you're creating a diagnostic tool, which is just utterly amazing, but then there's a next step to that, right? Which is yeah. treatment and so, so, you, so Right. And, and it depends on, it depends on the segments because some segments require a physician's, a physician as an intermediary, some, some um, not as much, but that, but closing, I think that, that the notion of make this as easy as it can possibly be as convenient as it can be and close the gap as much as possible between, you know, diagnosis and treatment and, um, and and just you know making that journey, particularly in this case for you know for parents of a, of a very unhappy child, you know um, making that journey as as pain free as it can possibly be is you know we w that's that's a folk that would be a focus area for us and and um, but there you know there remain especially when it comes to devices um, there remains you know the the physician uh, or the healthcare professional as an intermediary. And you can you can tell through telemed and lots of other approaches that 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 they are much more accessible, and these and these digital tools and devices help that help to bring them closer to the consumer consumer um, in a way that's that's you know much more appropriate for the for the situation. So we think that's all that's all really cool technology. It's incredible, Kathy. Listen, this I really enjoyed the conversation. I hope you did too. And just thank you, thank you for doing this. Thank you for. What you're doing at Kenview, I think there's a lot of exciting future there. Thank you for your support for consumer brands. Uh, it means a lot to us. Uh, and just uh, thank you for what you do. This has been a great conversation. I'm sure uh, our, the audience has enjoyed it as well. And let's do it again. Uh, we'll check in with you again next year. See, yeah. see how it's well, evolved. David, I, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. I'm enjoying being part of the association. And um, and it's just great to share ideas uh, on, on especially in this, you know, space of health and wellness. We just, we love talking about it, obviously. So, um, but thanks very much. Hope everybody has a great day. Great. Thank you, everybody.